Uh, before you sit down, I, I know, listen, I know we just prayed and, and everything. Y'all should know me by now. We're going to write into the word. I want to read the word together. It's going to be found in Romans chapter 11, starting in verse 11. We're still in our series, Overcoming Passivity. Uh, this may conclude this series. I have thoroughly enjoyed preaching this. Uh, it's a challenge every single man and woman here to become uh, active participants in their families and active participants in their church and in their, their personal lives with, with God. But uh, Romans chapter 11, starting at verse 11. Say amen when you're there. Amen. So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. So as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now, I am speaking to you Gentiles in as much then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from death? If the dough offered at first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. Verse 17, but if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild, some of y'all are wild, so I'm just going to put that out there. But if some of the branches which were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I may be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you. Provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. Father, thank you for this word. Father, I pray that it penetrates our heart. That, that the fruit would begin to bear as we learn to live as active followers of your son. Father, we love you. I just pray a blessing over the, the food we're going to partake in in a little bit. A blessing over this message that each and every person within the sound of my voice would receive a fresh revelation of who you are. Father, we ask these things in Jesus' powerful name. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. Go ahead and smack your neighbor, give him a high five. Pull their chair out if you're a gentleman, amen. I love to hear you guys talk. I love it. I love it. So have you been enjoying the services so far in this series, Overcoming Passivity? How, have you guys enjoyed the messages? Yes. Three of you. Praise God. That's all I need. That's all I pray for. Anything else above that is a blessing. Um, one of the, the, the main characteristics that we have covered in the past few weeks talking about passivity is the idea that, uh, and I've even had it in my image for YouTube and Facebook, the idea of burying our heads in the sand to avoid problems. That is passivity. It's, it's trying to ignore what is happening around you and oftentimes inside of us by burying our heads in the sand. But I want to venture to say there's also another type of passivity that I believe Paul talks about in this text. And so we have three points, three ideas Three arguments that I want to go over, and I believe that if we will take note, if we will pay attention, if we will, if we will let the Spirit of God speak during a service, I believe that we will be set free from a lot of different things. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let me ask you a question. How's my voice right now? Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Yes? Everything's good? I'm just a little worried because I might get a little passionate and start yelling. I don't want to hurt nobody's ears. You know what I mean? But uh, I want to tell you something. It, I, I was looking up different stories. If you ever come to my house, you're going to notice something in my kitchen 
Uh, it's very low key. It's very, it's very unsuspecting. But when it's working, you, you know it's working. And almost every single person that has come to our house and spent time in our home and seen this thing work goes out and buys one, okay? And that's the, it's a bug zapper to be more specific. And this thing's amazing. So what, it looks like a little mini uh, uh, what, a racket, I guess, a tennis racket. And it, it, it goes in a stand and it has this glow. And what happens is throughout the day, you'll hear a pop. But it's not like a little pop. Like it's like... Like, God's, like, condemning these bugs to eternal damnation. Like, that's what it sounds like. And I'm sorry, but I get super excited when I hear this thing pop. It's so loud that I can be upstairs in my room, and you will hear this thing pop throughout the night. Because I have kids, and they're always coming in and out of the house. And we live by a bunch of trees, and so bugs are inevitable. And if it was up to me, every bug would experience the zap of the Holy Spirit through this, this thing I've purchased and the reason I share this is because it, it's amazing how in one sense, a light beacon can mean salvation, grace, and hope for ships that are lost at sea. In another context, a same light, the same production of light can mean death. And it, it's amazing how we're drawn to light and how light can be falsely made to draw things in, inevitably leading to death. And so when I, I was reading this, this text, and I've been going over all week and just asking God to give me the words to speak. I, I, there, there's really three different topics from verse 18 to 22 we're going to focus on. But before I get into it, what I want to share is that Paul is making an argument that this text, what we just read, is his vision statement for his ministry. That he preaches to the Gentiles, which is for the most part all of us. He preaches to the Gentiles hoping that it will make the Israelites jealous that they would be drawn into Christ and drawn into a new salvation through the Messiah that they, they couldn't see. And so I, I speak that because I, I feel like we, we kind of miss that purpose when it comes to faith in churches today. We've really made it more about us. And so what I, want to do, I want to draw attention to, to Paul's approach to what ministry, what church, what the gospel is truly meant to do. Because I have to tell you that we would be blind if we ignore that the Israelites are the chosen people of God. Can we agree on that? Yes? Do you all read your Bible? Do I need to go back to the beginning? Like they, they were picked, handpicked, chosen by God to be the chosen people. And just because they missed the Messiah doesn't mean they've been cast out completely. It says that yes, the branches were broken off, but Paul makes this argument, and it's, it's poetic in the way he describes it, that as soon as they accept and experience Christ through, through Jesus, the, the blessing that will come on every single person, including the nation of Israel, is going to be more than we can possibly imagine. And, and that's our hopes, is that we would live in such a way as followers of Christ that we would make those outside of the church jealous, especially the Jews, the Israelites. Amen? And so I want to make you understand, like, we always talk about, like, this is not a comparison. We're not trying, you know, focus on yourself. Oh, no. Paul says, like, no, let the Jews compare themselves to us when it comes to our faith in Christ. Because if they see the blessings and the fruits from the Holy Spirit that has come upon the Gentiles, they'll be drawn into fellowship. That they won't be able to argue against that. And so he's making this whole grand argument in favor of the Israelites returning back to God through Jesus as the Messiah. Okay, but we have an important part in this, in this picture, in this goal, in this circle of life. Amen? Simba, Kumba, no? Okay. All right, so what I, want you to, I want you to write this down for point one. I, it's... And, and please hear me. These are the words of Paul, okay? I'm just, I'm piggybacking off of his words. And so in verse 18, it says, do not be arrogant towards the branches. Write this down for point one. Avoid self-elevation. Avoid elevating yourself. You see, Paul's ministry was to the Gentiles without a doubt. He is an apostle to the Gentiles. And he gives this caution. Do not be arrogant towards the branches. Because if you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. And that word arrogant has a, a bigger meaning. What it actually means is to be, uh, consider yourself superior. And so that's the arrogancy that he's talking about. Don't consider yourself superior because you've been grafted into the tree. But put your life in perspective of what God is doing through you. 
And he, he reiterates this over and over again. And I have to understand, why would he have to reiterate, don't be arrogant, don't be prideful, if it wasn't a serious threat in our faith? And, and I have to tell you that I've experienced this firsthand in different church settings and in different walks of faith with Christians as baby Christians and mature Christians. There's always a season after we come to Christ where we get really judgmental. Do you all remember that phase? Like y'all were on the streets doing the same exact thing, but then you got saved in church. Not church, church. You, know, you got saved in church, and the Holy Spirit came on you, and you got filled, and all of a sudden, the superiority came over us. We learned a couple of words. How you doing, sir? Sanctified, blessed. <laughs> doing all right. Don't even know what sanctified means, but you heard it in church. God is good. God is good. God is good. Don't act like you don't know these cliches. God is good. All the time. And all the time. Amen, Amen you bunch of. <laughs> Listen, but this is what happens. We, we gain the superiority, this, this complex of thinking that we're better than those outside of the tree of life. And so he cautions against this because there's nothing that we've done or can do to earn the gift that he's given us. And so what do we have to be arrogant about? Why? Because we're grafted in. We're only here because God wants to draw his people back to him. Now, don't get it twisted. I, like, I'm okay being second choice. I'm completely fine with it because I'm still, I'm still going to heaven. Amen? And I'm okay with God using me to draw his people back into his presence. I'm fine with that. But if we start getting arrogant, if we start considering ourselves superior because that word superior means that we elevate ourselves above the other people. And the problem with this is because, remember, we talked about passivity. It's normally we bury our head in the sand, and we don't want to see the problems happening. But in the same context, you can also consider yourself superior above your problems. How many of y'all have heard this? Soar like an eagle above your problems. Eagles don't care about what's happening. They soar at a higher level. Even eagles got to land. Eagles got to eat. Guess what? Eagles have to come down at some point. And so if we, we live in this constant state of superiority trying to avoid our problems, well, that's beneath me. No, it's not. You wonder why eagles can soar so high? Because their vision is so good. Eagles can see up to two, they can see a rabbit up to two miles away. So you understand that for them, soaring high is not defensive. Because we treat soaring high like we're on the defense. Ain't nothing going to touch me. Nothing's going to come at me. I'm going to soar high like the eagles. I'm going to soar like on the wings of eagles. And all, all these little things we say. But the eagles aren't soaring to avoid problems. They're using it as an advantage to attack the problem. They're hungry. And so what do they do? They soar high so they can have a good perspective. You see, Christians, when we get really superior in our spirit, we think that we're better because we're in the church and other people are outside the church. We're elevating ourselves. Yeah, you're soaring like, a, like an eagle, but you got no 20-20. Your vision is all about you. It's about avoiding what's really happening in your life. And so if you want to soar like an eagle, if you really want to soar on the wings of eagles, you need to have good vision. You need to understand what's happening around you. You cannot avoid problems. You, not, you cannot become passive by gaining the sense of superiority. And this is what Paul is urging against. He says, then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. They were broken off because of their doubt. And Paul says, it's because of your faith that you're able to stand in the presence of God. And this contradicts a lot of the teachings that we hear in church nowadays, isn't it? You're special. You are unique. You have a purpose on your life. You have a calling, and you are going to change the world. Here's the thing. All true statements, but without proper context, it will lead you to being in a state of being superior than everybody else. Well, God chose me. Yeah, kind of by default, though. I mean, like, we got in, but it wasn't anything we've done. And so, yes, you are unique, and you are beautiful, and you are handsome, and you are funny, and you are smart, and God loves you, and he strokes your hair at night while you're laying there. Does that make you feel better? But the, but the truth is, is that while these things can be true, and they are true, we do have a purpose, and we do have a calling. God has brought us in for a reason beyond ourselves. And see, and so while faith is very much about a personal relationship with Christ, a personal relationship with the Savior, absolutely. 
it's not the end-all be-all. As a matter of fact, it's a way of refreshing ourselves to go out into the world to be the beacon of hope and not a bug zapper. You see, that's why I brought that up, because as a church, we're meant to be a beacon of hope. We're supposed to draw people in. They're supposed to see the light in a dark world and come into the presence of God. We're supposed to exhibit so much beauty and grace and mercy that they're just drawn to us like, like moths to a flame. Unfortunately, most of us have closed off our churches and made this like a social club. And so while we have the, the, the light of hope and, and the light of grace, as soon as they come in, they get zapped, but not in a good way. And so because they might not fit in, they might not look the same of us, or they might not worship the same, or, or God forbid they have questions or doubts, we zap them. Well, you don't look like us. Thank God we don't all look alike. Thank God we all don't worship the same. Do you know how boring church would be if y'all looked and did and acted the same exact way? I'm just saying, like, it, it's, it, it's our taste, it's our individual flavor, our culture, our backgrounds, our testimonies that adds flavor to the church experience. See, when I preach, I preach from my personal testimony. I preach from my own interaction with God. When you're hearing things, you're hearing through your own lenses and what you've experienced in life. If you're going to try to be like everybody else so that you fit in, it's going to be boring. And that's why some of y'all are nodding off in church. It's why I got to hoot and holler sometimes to keep your attention. It's why I got to move so much to keep you engaged. Because you're so busy trying to look and sound like everybody else, you're exhausted. And so, please write this down. Avoid self-elevation. This is point two. Avoid self-inflation. In verse 20, it says, They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. Ready? So do not become proud, but fear. But isn't that a contradiction? Doesn't perfect love cast out fear? Oh, absolutely. Irrational fear. You want to know what irrational fears are? Irrational fears are, uh, for one, flying in planes. That's irrational fear. Because there's no pending doom, okay? Um, uh, spiders. Anybody have a phobia of spiders? Don't be shy. I hate them too. But, there, but it's an irrational fear. I shared this once, and I hated doing it. I'm going to do it again, though. When I was a kid, I had an irrational fear of snakes coming through the toilet. You want to know Why? I remember watching a news thing when I was a kid about a snake that came up through the toilet system in New York. That's where I'm from. And, and they went to the bathroom. And it was coiled up underneath the rim. So it wasn't even like, it's not even bad enough that it made its way in, but it was hiding. And I'm going to tell you, I was, like, I was like paranoid to go to the bathroom. I'm just, I'm just being honest with you. The, 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 I, it, it shook me. But it was irrational. Because how many times have you had a snake come up in your toilet? Anybody? <laughs> Not one of us, right? That, those are irrational fears. They make no sense because there's no pending doom. There's no actual threat to our lives. Now, if somebody pulls a knife on you, you have a rational fear of potentially being stabbed. That's rational. That makes sense. And, and one of the things that we get confused about is this idea of different fears. And so when he says, do not become proud, but fear. That word proud means to be inflated, to be full of yourself. A hot air. Don't be inflated of yourself. Don't be full of yourself, but instead fear God. And the fear that we're talking about is putting us all into context. If God were to take away his breath from us, if God were to remove his presence from this world, do you understand that we would all stop? Not like, oh, we'd have hard times. No, it would all stop. Time in and of itself would stop. You have breath in your lungs right now. Everybody take a deep breath. <sighs> he allowed that to just to happen. Do you understand that? Every moment you have, every breath you have is a gift from God. It is meant to be used intentionally. And we take it for granted. And so we get so full of ourselves and so inflated of our own pride and so inflated of our ambitions and our goals and our dreams and what we want, we don't have any room left for the will of God. And so one of the things that I think Paul is trying to teach us is that as we deflate, as we gain a healthy fear of God, that we become less full of ourselves. 
And I have to tell you that it's, it's a drastic change. Because when you are full of yourself, guess what you're always thinking about? Yourself. When you are full of yourself, guess who you're really trying to focus on when you're trying to get money and trying to get ahead and trying to develop a family and trying to start a business? Are you thinking about the world? Let's be honest. No, it's us. Everything we do and every plan we have is geared towards what is going to make us feel better, what's going to make us feel comfortable, what's going to be the best for us. And Paul is saying that in, in, in light of what God has done for us, by choosing us wild olive branches, y'all are just buck wild, some of y'all. I see you on Facebook. I, the ones watching right now that haven't come into church say, I, I know y'all are just buck wild, okay? There, there's sides of you that, that the flesh is still trying to die off, and God is still doing the work in you, praise God. But some of y'all still have a little bit of wildness in you, Okay? And in the midst of that wildness, he still grafted you into the tree. Why? Not because of your behavior, not because of the way you look or your worship style or how well you can sing or clap on beat. None of those things matter. He has one requirement, one thing that he is looking for. It is faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. That's it. That's the requirement. And he goes, so what do you have to be proud about? You've done nothing. As a matter of fact, you made it in in spite of you. That's the truth. That, that's, that's our testimonies. It's not like, I, I did this and I, I, no, you didn't. It was in spite of us, in spite of our behaviors and our best choices. God chose us. And, and guess why? Ultimately, why he does this is because he wants to draw every single last person back into his presence. And how's that going to happen if we're not taking what we experience here out there. It only happens when we become a portable church. Do you, not low KC. It's a big building. I ain't, I ain't putting no wheels on this. The capital C. As in where you go, as you go, you bring Christ with you. That is a portable church. You understand where you work is a church. Where you go to school, who you live with, who you hang out with, those are churches. Now, you might be preaching, you might be leading worship, but it's you. Nobody else can do it for you. But if you are so self-inflated with pride about how you got saved, and how God's working in your life, and how God loves you, and ain't nobody else got the blessing like I got the blessing, you might need a little bit of deflation. Because Paul says, for if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. And that should put the fear of God into you. If he were to cut off the branches of his chosen people, why do you think he wouldn't do that to us? You know, it, it, this is what it comes down to. A choice. Every single one of us has a choice. And that choice will determine if you are going to be grafted in or broken off. And that choice is, are you going to have faith in Jesus. You cannot live a life of self-inflation, self-indulgence, and think that God's going to be okay with it because you said a prayer once. That contradicts the very word of God. He goes, because you have been chosen, because you are now grafted into the tree, here are the expectations of being my people. Are you ready for point three? You can never stop moving. This is not a, a, I got saved, and now I'm going to go back to life the way it was. And now I'm going to go back to work and go back to movies and, and, and music, and, and nothing else changes because I, I said a prayer. I'm saved now, right? And I know that seems silly to some of us, but some of us think like it's, it's a pivotal point. I said a prayer, now everything else is going to be, I'm saved. No, we are in a continual state of growth. Anybody else thankful that they're not who they used to be? Yeah, we need to. Like, you're wild, but you used to be a lot more wild, weren't you? Yeah, oh yeah. I know you all defeated, like deleted your old Facebook pages. And, and for some of y'all, your MySpaces and all that stuff. Listen, I'm just, I, we have come a long way as followers. Even in this church, the, the past two years, I have seen so much spiritual growth. 
Like, I am blown away by how God continues to work in these sermons and in these, these times of worship and fellowship. I, I am amazed that God can use so many dysfunctional people to make something so beautiful. But we can't stop moving. And so in verse 22, it says, Then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you. And here's the expectation. Provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. I, I wanted to get into this idea of peace. Because you got to remember, everything that we've been talking about the last three weeks has been about passivity. Avoiding problems until the point that the problems are no longer avoidable. We've seen this in David and Absalom and Tamar and Amnon. And, and we've seen how passivity can destroy families. It can destroy relationships. It can, it can destroy innocence. There's so much danger in being passive, especially in our faith, but in every paradigm of our lives. As leaders, as husbands and, and fathers and mothers and wives and children, passivity can destroy those relationships. It can, it can just put a damper on our future prospects as men and women of God. But here, I love Paul saying this, is that it's, it's not about what we can and can't do, but as long as we are continuing to chase after the kindness of God and to make that kindness our own. You see, that the, the word kindness, what they're referring to in Greek, it means to be honest, it means to be responsible, and it means to be of good character. And they're describing God this way, that he is honest and his character is good. And he is reliable and faithful. And so what they're saying is that because of his kindness, we've been brought into the tree of life. But now that we are grafted in, it's our responsibility to be responsible and to be kind and good stewards and faithful and loving and show mercy and show grace. And if anybody else is having a hard time with this, you're not alone. Because it's a lot easier to say those things than to have to do it when you're around people that annoy you. I, do I need to repeat that? The, the fruits of the Spirit are really easy when people are involved. I can be joyful. And I can have patience and peace and comfort and, and grace and mercy. But some of the people that God brings into my life challenges the very paradigms of my faith sometimes. I'm just being real. Or can we be real for a moment? You want to know the greatest way God will, will refine you and, and, and just cultivate you into the man or woman he's called you to be? He's going to bring people into your life that you can't stand. And, and here's the thing. While we're wishing they would go away, God's using them as sandpaper to refine us. And so in the process of, of situations and circumstances that feel unbearable and uncontrollable, we have to keep moving forward. And some of y'all are taking baby steps. And I got to be honest with you, I don't care how small the step is, as long as you're still moving forward. And, but, but just as important it is to move forward, sometimes you do have to look back. Sometimes you do have to look back and, and realize, man, I've come a far way. To reflect on who you were and what you did before Christ. Because not only will that, that give you a good perspective, it'll gain a fear. Because just as easy it was to fall in love with Christ, some of us, if we don't have the right context in our lives, can fall out of love. Because the answer is no, some of us get very upset. And it's easy for us to become tainted by the idea that, is he really listening to me? Does he really love me? And Paul says that it's the kindness and the severity of God. You see, I didn't know that he was still kind and severe. I'm going to be honest with you, because a lot of teachings I've always heard was, the Old Testament God was severe. The New Testament God is a hippie. Anybody else? Like, that's like the image that they've kind of painted. Death, wrath, kill, destroy, love everybody. Peace on earth. Peace, man. Like, that's, that's, that's the image that's been painted by, by the church. But I got to tell you, guess what? The character of the Old Testament God and the character of the New Testament God, they're the same God. Amen. Amen. And so Paul knows this. He goes, listen, as much as Jesus was all about love, and as much as Jesus taught us to pray for our enemies and to show mercy and to show kindness, don't forget that as severe as he was with his own people, oh, he'll do the same thing to you. 
Uh, he'll, he'll, put, he'll break us off in a moment. Does that scare you? It should. Can I tell you, listen, a lot of us treat church as like, well, is there something better happening? Is there something better happening? Because there's nothing better happening, I'll come to church. I got to tell you, ain't nothing better happening on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. than what's happening right here at Touchpoint Church. But, but, we find excuses. Well, I'm not ready to go to church yet. I, I, have, to, I have to get a little bit better at, at being a person, then I'll come to church. It don't work like that. Well, I, I still struggle with things. I can't go to church yet. There's a game on. I can't miss it. All the guys just went like, crap. <laughs> Do you understand that, that church, the fellowship that we have, this should be the reason for missing other things? Amen. This should be the reason for missing other things in our lives. Amen. I need Jesus. I need, I need my fellowship. Can I ask you a question? Are you trying to fit God into your schedule? I'll tell you, I, listen, I've been getting up. I've been spending time with him, praying in the morning and reading, and I'm loving every second of it. I'm getting caught up in it, and I'm loving every second of it. But for the longest time, I tried to squeeze God in. I, I, I read a devotional every day, and I, I listen to worship while I'm driving, and I listen to sermons while I'm driving, and I'm trying to squeeze God in every little crevice and nook that I had available. How arrogant is it to think that I have to squeeze God into my schedule? That I have to squeeze God into my time? I'm doing you a favor, Jesus. I'm trying, I'm trying to get you some time today. My schedule should revolve around his schedule. Let me, let me rephrase that because I'm making it about me. Your schedules, your daily lives should focus around God's will for your life, not your own ambitions and not your own goals and not your own dreams and not your own, your own tasks and response, things you think you have to get done. No, God should be orchestrating every aspect of that. He should not be something we try to squeeze in. He is our day. He is our schedule. He is our planner. So some of y'all need to throw out your 2024 planners right now. Because I promise you that the more you walk with God, the more he'll start crossing off stuff. Like, nope, we're not doing this. Nope, we're not going here. Nope, your car's going to break down. Guess what? Well, I'm going to show you my grace and the mercy in the midst of it. Nope, a new bill's coming and you didn't expect. But guess what? If you have some faith, we can tackle this together. Your schedule is laughable. Our ambitions and our dreams are laughable. And in sight of what God has in store for us. And so we cover three different things. Avoid self-elevation. Stop elevating ourselves, being arrogant in regards to God. And I know that word sounds really harsh. Paul said it. I'm just repeating. If you've got a problem, take it up with him. Uh, avoid avoid self-inflation, being prideful, being full of ourselves and what we want to do and how we feel. And never stop moving. Never stop moving. Ne never, never think you've arrived. Never think that you are, you are too far along to learn something new. Don't think that you are beyond God's reach. Amen? You all with me? And I promise you that as we overcome this passivity in our lives, as, as we stop elevating ourselves above the problems and, and hoping they'll just kind of solve themselves, and as we start elevating ourselves to his level where he calls us to be, you will see that he will speak to you regarding the problems that you're afraid to face. You see, some of us in here, we, we've been so hurt in the past. We've, we've had bad things happen to us. And so as soon as anything resembles that pain or, or reflects or mirrors where we were in that season when we were hurt or betrayed or traumatized, we want to run. That's an irrational fear. It's causing a, a fight or flight in us. And if it's one thing I know about my God, man, he's a fighter. He's never stopped fighting for me. I know he's never stopped fighting for you. And so why would we think that we have to run away from problems that he wants to fight with us? And some of the greatest fights that we will ever do happen at the altar, in our prayer time, 
in our reading, in our fellowship. And so as we prepare to go into Thanksgiving, that's what I'm thankful for. I'm thankful that in spite of who I was and all my character defects, I know it doesn't seem like if I had a lot, I'm, st I'm still a work in progress, amen? But with my history and everything of who I was, he has never stopped fighting for me. He's never given up on me. He didn't, he didn't give me a, a, a three count. He didn't do that. Oh, strike one. Two more and you're out. Strike two. Oh, no. His grace has been unlimited in my life. And my marriage and my children and this church and every good thing I have going for me is because of his willingness to fight for me.